Welcome to the Retiring Real Estate Investor Podcast, where we will discuss how to defer taxes on the sale of your property, earning passive real estate income, and everything you need to know to go from active investor to passive investor. Join us as we interview passive investment sponsors, explore the journey of other retiring real estate investors, and share our due diligence process we perform to select passive investments. Investment advisory services provided by Insight Investment Advisors, LLC, a registered investment advisor. This podcast is only intended for clients and interested investors residing in the states in which we are registered to provide investment advisory services or exempt from registration. Please contact us to determine if the firm provides investment advisory services in the state where you reside. All content on this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Material presented is believed to be reliable sources, and no representations are made by our firm as to another party's informational accuracy or completeness. Insight Investment Advisors LLC and its representatives do not provide tax or legal advice, and nothing herein should be construed as such. Always consult with your tax advisor or attorney regarding your specific circumstances. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Retiring Real Estate Investor Podcast. Uh, I'm super excited because I have Ryan Gibson. He is a founder, CIO of Spartan Investment Group um, in Seattle today. Is that right, Ryan? Yep, in Seattle at our podcasting in Seattle, studio. Our, <laughs> in the studio. I've in had the, the studio. honor of being in the studio in person, which is absolutely awesome. It yeah. puts my, as everyone can see, my living room studio to shame. It is, it's, uh, it's gorgeous and an awesome setup. But uh, Ryan, thanks so much for your time today. Yeah, thanks for coming out to Seattle and visiting with us and speaking at our meetup. We do a first Friday meetup, and you also talked to uh, you had you were on our podcast, the Passive Income Pilot Podcast, that launched uh, last week, and we're excited that you're going to be our second guest on the show. So, and and who's the first guest, Ryan? The first guest was Guy Adami from CNBC's Fast Money. You might see that guy on on TV every time you turn on the TV around five o'clock. So, uh, you know, we just wanted to, you know. You you were good, you know, but I think guy guy kind of <laughs> guy took that first spot. So, oh, uh, man. But, but man, that the first episode was killer. We had hundreds of downloads, which is awesome for like a launch. And uh, yeah, our podcast is focused on most. It's it's on the aviation community. I know your father was a pilot or in the in the aviation space, but it's really for anybody. It's uh, you know, but it just kind of has the pilot spin on things. So guy Adami, we talked about the status of the. Uh, aviation industry and we talked about stocks and the market and when this crash is coming and all kinds of catchy things like that so tough act to follow i, I hope i did my best so we'll, <laughs> we'll see how it, we'll see how it works well, itself I, out yeah i love what you provide i mean you know having that ability to you know there's so many pilots out there who become like you say accidental real estate investors they inherit these pro portfolios of single family homes and what's great is that i have a lot of pilots that are in that base where they want to get rid of that. They want a 1031 and do a DST. And then they want ha want to have that income be passive, but still be in real estate. So you really got my uh, juices going on that one. So yeah, no, and maybe we'll scratch out the title on this one. Sorry, retired real estate investor. Maybe this is the accidental real estate investor pod today because the, you know, pilots aren't alone. Um, we encounter this and probably I'd say maybe a third of our client base they're looking to do something similar in the space that our retired real estate investors are looking to do. They have these properties and they've gotten up just to that level where, Ooh, maybe I should go a step further and get asset management, really start to focus some attention here, but maybe I don't want to actually do that. And it becomes a very tough decision for them to sort of make about, well, where do I go next? Do I just sell these things? Do I give them to someone else? Do I, do, what do I do? And I think a lot of people get very stuck there. Um, about what to what to kind of do next do you have is that a very similar conversation that you're having with the pilots as daily. well or like i don't have enough time to do this daily i mean they yeah they just it's like they have a bunch of single families that they you know it could be could be intentional or accidental in that you know they maybe inherited the property or they bought a rental property every time they were based at a new military base or they just collected these throughout the year they have them typically they've appreciated but they just don't want to deal with them anymore and and that's and then they they run into me and they say hey how can i turn in my my homes through some self storage opportunities and not pay taxes on the uh, on the sale and i think that's where 
now we're working together kind of to, to provide that opportunity for those investors, which is incredible. Um, yeah. I mean, shoot, can I sell everything I own and do that? Cause that sounds really nice. Um, I, I, the, the title of your podcast is really intriguing. It's like, can I be retired too? Cause I, that, that'd be, that, that sounds good right about now. So hundred <laughs> percent when, whenever you're ready, whenever you're ready, it's a, uh, it's a decision. So let's, let me spin you right. back as we went down the podcast route and we want to link that to the show notes so that, so that folks can follow you there and listen to more of those episodes. Those are going to be awesome. Um, talk to us about, about Spartan and, and give, and give the listeners some background about yourself and how you ended up, um, ended up starting the firm. Yeah. So Scott Lewis and I are the co-founders. We both met each other as neighbors in Washington, DC. I have a background as an airline pilot, hence the passive uh, income pilots podcast and the references to pilots. And I was flying for us airways express at the time air wisconsin based in based in appleton there uh at our dca base and i was very you know i've always been very entrepreneurial and one day i met my business partner he was walking down the street uh, michigan state grad uh, scott lewis and we started spartan by basically just flipping houses on the block that we lived on and uh, we worked on our business plan our strategic plan we worked on our roadmap right out of our living rooms. Uh, we were literally next door neighbors. And our first investors were our neighbors. They were people that lived in the neighborhood and knew the projects that we were buying. And we ended up doing a handful of ground up developments around Washington, DC, in our nation's capital, up by CYU, uh, over in the Anacostia neighborhood, sort of buying these distressed properties and flipping them and building uh, condo buildings actually sometimes or doing short plats, you know, subdividing land. We became land developers essentially, but uh, something was missing. And, and uh, we actually met uh, Ben Lapidus in Denver when Scott ended up moving out there. I moved up, moved out to Seattle and um, Ben brought a element of good financing strategy and also cash flow. So now we do. And, and we said, you know what, at about the time we were like, you know, we want to get into something that's recession resistant, something that's uncorrelated to the market that we can scale our company with. And we quickly landed on self storage. And so since then we've built a self storage investing platform. That's the 40th largest, we're the 40th largest owner and operator of self storage now in the United States. We've been uh, Inc 500's fastest growing uh, one of the fastest growing privately held real estate companies the last three years in a row, uh, vet 100 the last three years in a row. And now we've got uh, about 120 or so employees and we offer investors the opportunity to invest in either ground up development, self storage or cash flowing existing storage as equity investors, as LPs, or they can invest in our debt fund, which is backed by self storage that pays a regular coupon, 1099 INT, et cetera. And so yeah, lots of uh, mistakes made along the way, lots of lessons learned, and and, uh, <laughs> and a lot of fun growing a um, you know about a half a billion in assets over the last few years. I'm a, I'm gonna wind you all the way back to <laughs> you walking the neighborhood with with your partner and finding homes you wanted to flip. What, how did that conversation even start? You guys just just wandering around, letting you hey, would it be cool if we bought it, that? It, no, it's actually a little bit more running right into it than that. Um, so the house that actually, if you go, you can Google this, uh, it, it doesn't matter. 1352 L Street Southeast, Washington, D.C., 2003 is the very first house we ever flipped. And on the left of that house, if you're facing it, is a white house. And the right is a kind of camo colored house with an extension on the top. The right house was Scott. The left white house was mine. And the house in the middle was actually... It was abandoned house. It was really easy. It was like, you know, the oh. walls that were in between me and Scott, there was an abandoned property there. And I'll never forget, the, uh, there was like a homeless guy living in there for a while who like listened to Whitney Houston, like on full blast, like all the time. And I could hear it through the walls. And, uh, you know, my wife, there was like, sorry for the vulgarness here, but there was prostitution yeah. literally happening in this pink shed in the backyard. Oh, it wow. was... Um, yeah. And so Scott and I just kind of got fed up with it. And and Scott really took the bull by the horns more than I did. He he went and was like, I'm going to figure out, I'm going to buy that house. And so it was funny. He found the owner of the house uh, and called her. And turns out, you know, the house was like, it was uh, owned by these guys or no, it was owned by this, this guy who died. And then it went to 
his son and then his son died and then it went to a brother and the brother died. And then it was this like distant relative who owned the house now and uh, Interesting. Or didn't, didn't own the house, but she had like the rights and there was no will, there was no probate, there was no estate, there's nothing, but she kind of had this loose connection to the property. And so we actually helped her go through the entitled uh, go through, go through the whole quiet title, quick claim deed, except there was a problem in the nineties, this LLC out of New York that had dissolved, had bought the tax lien at oh. tax auction. And so that LLC had dissolved. So we had to figure out how to get a hold of them. And, uh, it turned out that the owner had actually made good on his tax bill. So oh. they were nice enough to give us a quick claim deed. Um, and so we got quiet title. We got the ownership into the name of this, this lady. We ended up getting like a hundred thousand dollar house in Washington DC in our nation's capital, like in Capitol Hill. And uh, the day that we got the right to buy the house, we got the paper all cleared up. We had a, a real estate agent offer us two hundred thousand, huh. so we could actually wholesale it for. We're like, wow, we could. Do, this is this is like an accidental wholesale. We didn't even know what wholesaling mm -hmm. was, but we're like, no, we're real estate developers. We want to take this property and build it. We want to like hire the construction company. We want to build the property. We want to become real estate developers. So. We took it through its paces. I think it was another 150 grand or so in expenses. And then we sold the house for 550 K. And, wow. uh, so it was a nice little turn. And then we said, okay, what other houses on the block look like this one? And there's this whole dynamic in Washington, DC. I don't know how it is today, but back in, you know, 2014 to 2020 or 2020, at least that time frame, there, there's just these abandoned houses and it's just time it's it's these the people die and they pass away and the house just sort of sits there and and no one knows who owns it and no one really has like a a direct line to the title and so that was our jam for like five years is just finding these like rundown looking properties and just unwinding the problems which is why we made our mission our mission statement comes from that and which is to improve lives through our values and so our approach was like we're helping the neighborhood. We're helping the owner. We're helping their investors. We're, you know, we're doing like all these things and we're finding because like a lot of the title companies were like, gosh, no one is willing to go through this pain that you guys are going through. But, you know, if you wait it out, like you, you'll end up with like a good piece of property at a great price. And so everybody's winning. Um, so, man, it was really cool. We helped like DC firemen. We had a, this, uh, this lady, Angie, we helped her out. Uh, her, her, both of her, um, the house was burned in a fire at Anacostia. We did the same thing. We, we helped her through the tax sale, got a huge mm -hmm. amount back on her taxes. Uh, there's a nice video about it with her and it on, on the internet somewhere on Spartan home buyers is what we called our DBA. Oh. Um, but yeah, we just, you know, we just started and then, you know, it was cool. Like all of our neighborhood, there was a lot of dinner parties and things like that. And a lot of our neighbors would come over and we'd say to them, um, you know, Hey guys, we're going to buy that house like a couple blocks down. Do you want to invest in it with us? And they were mm. like, that's pretty cool what you guys are doing. I know that house. I know the street. I know where the values are. Mm. I know where the, I trust you guys. So we started syndicating with our neighbors. And then now we have 10,000 people on our list and, and uh, refer mostly referrals. And we've just kind of grown organically over the years um, on, in our investor base. So that's fascinating. Let me go, I'm going to go back because I think there's a moment in there where like, okay, here's a, here's a problem that's literally between our walls, as you described, and you guys fixed that was as soon as you guys did that fix and saw the value that you could create there, did that flip a switch for you where you're like, I want to do this many times over and I want to run through yeah. this whole neighborhood and I want to do it with you and I want you to be my partner. Was that the, was that the trigger? It was, yeah. And a, and a lot of little different puzzle pieces along the way, you know, I mean, you don't just do one thing and you resolve the whole problem. I mean we were listening to a lot of podcasts at the time and it was like, Oh, you can syndicate. Cause we put, you know, Scott and I took the hard headed approach. It was like, we were using all of our own money. You know, mm -hmm. I was a airline pilot and an FAA consultant at the time. So I was making great income. I was socking away, you know, four or 5,000 bucks a month. I saved up uh, some money. We put in $300,000 into our own company and um, we bought all this property three, three projects really. And then we ran out of money because we, we were, we were, we, all of our money was in pro property. Right. So it was like, now what do we do? And so we learned about syndication mm -hmm. and how you can bring in other investor capital and legally do it and do it the correct way. And we actually went to a conference called the secrets of successful syndication, which was put on by the real estate guys. This is like the spring of 2015. And we go down there and 
They're like, yeah, you got to do all this paperwork when you raise money. We're like, whoops. Well, okay. Uh, we'll make sure we do that next time. Um, so yeah, it's, and just, yeah. And, and then it was like the, now the light bulbs are going off. It was like, okay, we can find great property. We can bring in investors. We can structure this correctly. We can build a big, uh, and now it's like, it was just, the feeling was like, oh my God, we could do unlimited amounts of the syndication and use syndication as a tool to help us fuel what we ultimately want to build as a business. And, um, so we now we could really take our funds, get them back and invest in the company more and build the company and hire employees and things like that and then scale. And that's really what helped us get to the next level. What was that yeah. point where you made it? You've made a decision somewhere along the way where you said, OK, we found a couple here to do with our friends, our family, ourselves. When did it change to you? You guys said, OK, we want to be a firm that does this. What, what made when was that change? When did that happen for you guys? You know, it was always, always, Interesting. always. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. I, I would say I've always been more of like a deal guy. Like I love, you know, we had a great conversation this morning with Ben and mm-hmm. I would yeah. probably say that kind of stuff for me gets me excited. Uh, mm-hmm. The company building aspect of things is what really Scott has always been after, you know, the strategic approach to things, you know, he was more of the mindset. Let's build a Let's build a big business took me a couple of years to sort of like click, uh, on that. And, um, but I'm, I'm grateful to have him as a partner to kind of keep, keep us focused on building a business, not just doing a bunch of deals. Uh, mm-hmm. but you also need to do the deals to make a business, right? So it was a really nice partnership of, you know, strategy and, and tactics, um, you know, to kind of put together what we have today. So, um, but yeah, pretty much since the All beginning, right. you know, we've written a strategic plan every year, I'm sorry, every three years we refresh our strategic plan. So if you go to our website, you can download our strategic plan on our Spartan hyphen investors dot com page and you can see what our next three years calls for. We just refreshed it at the beginning of 2023 to take us into the later part of 2025. But we do that every year and it's, you know, we outline our goals and our objectives and where we want to go as a company. So, yeah. Big, big takeaways from here is it's really nice when you find someone that you can really work with to grow something and that is very aligned with what you want to do and is very complimentary to your skills is a huge thing. I feel like I have that same thing too, uh, with, with our partner here, Josh Wright, um, where he's very focused operationally and gets really excited about processes. I'm like, Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. And I'm kind of glazing over, but it feels so good to have someone so focused on that and passionate about the areas that I'm weaker at and to kind of fill in for me. What a huge, a huge thing to have. So now take us to take us to storage. So then you've you're starting to do these deals. You're starting to build this company. You got the syndication squared away. You're developing, and then you say, "Hey, we got to look for something a little different." Talk me through that that transition a little bit more. Yeah, we we came up with a valuation criteria, and that was easy to own, easy to evict, easy to maintain. We wanted to have an asset that we could scale, and those were the that was the key decision my making criteria. So we looked at like multifamily, industrial, retail, office, single family, Airbnb. We looked at all the different asset classes and self storage really stood out, especially when you look at the at self storage performance over the last 40 years. It's the least foreclosed upon asset class. It's the most stable in occupancy during even, you know, the dot com burst 2000, the Great Recession of 2008, COVID-19 pandemic, even Black Monday 1987. It's been the it's been stable. And uh, we wanted something, you know, as Scott was a military or is a military veteran, served in Iraq freedom. I'm an airline pilot where we've got risk at the top of our mind all the time. And so we wanted to be in an asset that we knew was going to do well during recessionary times and during good times. And so self storage was uh, was easily selected in that regard. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Give us give us the lay of the land currently, because I feel like. We're getting closer to some really difficult times. <laughs> is is the base case holding up? Because I think that's exactly the way that we look at storage is here's a here's a more defensive asset than the high flying multifamilies that we've seen over the past um, you know few the past few years. Even the industrial where we see a tremendous amount of demand for the reshoring, but obviously it hasn't been the case over the last decade. Is storage holding up now? Yeah, I, I want to change everybody's perspective on storage. You know, I think people think that self-storage is something that you need when you have too much stuff. 
you know, and, and, and there, to an extent that's true. But self-storage is a service that's providing a community with a place to handle and help with their life changes or their life events. And so, so self-storage will be when you're moving, when you're downsizing, when you're locating, when you're doing a renovation on your house, when you have divorce, when you have death, when you have um, a little league baseball team that needs a, a place to put their stuff, when you have a business that is downsizing, when it's COVID and you need to move all your stuff out of a room so you now you can work out at home, you can work from home, you can create that pocket podcast studio at home, you can do whatever it is you're going to do, you need to free up that space to make space for life. And so that's how we started. That's our brand, Free Up Storage. Um, so our company, freeupstorage.com, that's our, our self-storage brand. Our, our slogan is Make Space for Life. And the reason why is because self-storage, the driver of self-storage is life events. And so when you look at the COVID-19 pandemic, what happened? The whole world went into a huge life event. And because of that, people moved, downsized, relocated. I'll, I'll never forget, I was uh, piloting an airplane from Seattle to Florida, and I'm going through it and it's like March, like right when COVID-19 settled in and the plane had, you know, 200 seats or so on 186 seats. And I, there's one passenger on the plane and I go up to this lady and I say, Hey, you know, welcome aboard your private aircraft to, to, to Orlando or whatever the heck we we're going. <laughs> and, and I go, I got to ask like, where, what are you doing? You know, like, there's no one in the airport. There's no one go. I mean, we appreciate your business. Um, but where are you going? And she said, I'm going to Florida. My mom just passed away because I have to move her stuff into self-storage. And it just, I mean, I think just right then and there, it just kind of clicked. It's like these life events, it doesn't really matter what's happening in the U.S. economy. It's, you know, if you have a huge house and you just lost your job, guess what? You need to put your stuff in self-storage while you figure it out. If you have a business that's being closed temporarily, all that stuff is going into self-storage. Mm -hmm. Staging companies, uh, you know, whatever it might be. I mean, I thought self-storage was, was silly as a, uh, you know, as an owner myself, I, I thought, man, this is kind of a silly asset class until my kids, um, you know, I, I bought a new house and moved and I, you know, the, the real estate agent said, Hey, you gotta, you gotta get all your stuff out of here. And, you know, so we can stage and clean and paint and make it look like no one's living here and make it look, you know, sell the dream, right. Of, of being in this like house. <laughs> And so I put my stuff in storage and I could have done one of those pods or something, but you know, it's hard to, you know, the permit and how much is it? Will, will I fill up a pod? Will it be too many? How long will it take? I just went to self storage, mm -hmm. made it really easy. It was right, one right down the street. And because they're everywhere, they're all over the place. They become a, a part of society that knows that they're there to rely upon. You know, that any direction you drive your car, you're going to hit one in a mile or two. And so it's a very localized business that has become just part of society. And it's taken off in the United States versus other countries more because it started here. And I think it's becoming more accepted in this, uh, in this space. So sure, there's people with too much stuff. I mean, there's a whole Marie Kondo, you know, show about getting rid of stuff, people crying, but like at the end of the day, going into a recession, it's going to do really well and it, it continues to do really well. So I don't, I don't see it slowing down and it's only done exceptional during COVID. I mean, you look at the REIT data, self-storage is outperforming all other asset class types. If you go and average the 40 year trend on REITs, self-storage is the number one performer over multifamily, over industrial, over office. It is a staple or should be a staple in everybody's portfolio. So it's really good. The realization moment for us during the COVID was vacancy rates are dropping dramatically and rents are headed up and we're like what in the world is happening and the response that we got in these these units that we're looking at were oh these kids are moving out of college and they got to put their self stuff in this store i'm like oh man it's like it, we use this analogy too it feels like storage is like target it's like when times are good folks that shop at walmart shop at target when times are bad our sex fifth avenue folks they come and shop at Target, but someone's always right. shopping at Target one way or the yep. other. So we kind of equated it to that. If that's a fair, that's a fair analogy. Talk a little it bit is. about, and is that fair or yeah. no? No, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Good. And I, and I, that's and nice. I would just say one addition to that. I was just going to say one more thing is please. No, go uh, please. not only is that fair. Yeah. 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 So it's, not only is that a fair uh, analogy, but you know, 
during the pan the last two years, the industry has really benefited from a continuous life event. There has been, and, and you can see this, there's no seasonality in the last two years. There hasn't been any whatsoever. The occupancies have been high. The rates have been double digit increasing. But now that the pandemic is sort of tapering off and over, the industry immediately turned back to normal in that it's now got a seasonality aspect to it. It's kind of back to business as usual, but business as usual is really good. So to your point, I, and I was just kind of adding on to what you were talking about, you know, sex with Avenue people going out of Target or Walmart coming up to Target. Now that it's sort of back to normal, it's very predictable on what's going to happen. I mean, our leasing season is right around the corner. Our leasing season starts basically after Memorial Day. And all of a sudden you see, you know, vacancies just drop and, and occupancies shoot up. And so we're already seeing that. We're already seeing that trend. But now that the industry has really matured, and this has become sort of like a part of the main food group as far as like multifamily, industrial, et cetera, mm -hmm. now a lot of the big players are accumulating funds and getting ready to invest in the space. So Blackstone bought Simply Self Storage, $1.2 billion. Bill Gates bought in a quarter share of Store Mart. Inland Private Capital just monetized a very large portfolio. Public mm -hmm. Storage just put in a hostile big takeover. Life Storage, they've, they've and Public has purchased over $3 billion just in the last two years. So now in the, in the largest self-storage fund was just put together by Prime Group like two weeks ago or about a month ago now. Mm -hmm. So it's people now are like, I want this in my portfolio and the word is out and there's a lot of new money chasing opportunities in the, in the uh, space, which is great for us, um, you know, as holders of the assets. So very good. Any concern for folks coming in then to those assets, any concerns about that from maybe a holistic trend perspective, i.e. a lot of money flowing into a space tends to, you know, supply and demand constraints here, right? A lot more demand, less supply. We see price rise, maybe to levels that new buyers might not like. Is that a concern? It is. I mean, I think, you know, the more money that comes into something, you're going to inflate the balloon more and there's going to be less margin uh, in, in what you buy. There might be less return, but you also have the stability of knowing that your asset values are hold firm because of the, the capital, right? So it's good if you own, kind of not so good if you want to buy. But there's still opportunities. I mean, 70 plus percent of all facilities are still owned by mom and pop operators wow. who haven't optimized their facility to the best they can optimize to. So I think when you think about, you know, well, what opportunities are there? It looks like it's been all picked over. I mean, clearly, you know, the likes of Blackstone are in the space. So now there's just there's just no opportunities. It's not true. I mean, there's plenty of opportunities to find value, but they're, it's not it's not going to be easy. You know, there's, um, you know, there's not as many self storages out there as one would think. I mean, there's about 60,000 in the United States alone. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there's more self storages than all fast food chains combined, but there's also like millions and millions and millions of multifamily buildings in the United States. Right. So like mm -hmm. people hear about multifamily all the time, you know, multifamily, this multifamily, that I'm heavy in multifamily. I want to diversify. So they, 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 oh, I, storage, I never heard of that, or I heard a podcast or whatever. So they start to get into it, and then they realize, oh, this is just as competitive, if not more competitive, than multifamily. And, um, and so, you know, there are opportunities, but I would say the competition for buying the assets can be really fierce. So is, is the opportunity, is, is it, can I think about this on a buy market basis a little bit more too? There's got to be some differentiation there by market. So if, I, if I'm looking at the trends and you verify if I'm right or not, over the last five, say seven years, there's been a lot of construction of new multifamily, correct? But that's been concentrated maybe in major metros or in larger markets. Is that fair to say too? Or you think that's been more broad based at construction? Yeah, for storage, I would say that, you know, first of all, it's important to understand that self-storage is a hyper local market. So you mm -hmm. can't say like, Dallas is a good market or Colorado, you know, Denver is a good market or Milwaukee is a good market. You really don't know because it's, it's, it's all comes down to that main and main. Cause like I said earlier, hmm. if you're thinking about self-storage, you're not going to drive an hour 
you're going to go to the one within a mile or two of your house. So the demand for self-storage is going to be hyper-focused on where that property is located. Hmm. So now there can be some macro trends like population moving, employment centers, average household income, whatever it might be that, that make favorable conditions for self-storage. But the unmet demand for self-storage is going to be so specific to that location that it's hard to kind of pinpoint. As far as building, there's been more self-storage built from 2010 to 2020 than all of the prior years combined. Wow. So if, if you're thinking like, man, I see this stuff being built everywhere, you're right. It has been built everywhere. But here's what's fascinating as well. So 10 years, 2010 to 2020, there was more self-storage built than the last 40 years combined. And the industry average occupancy increased during that 10-year time frame from 80% to over 90%. So literally, we're doubling what exists and occupancy is going up 10% during that time as an industry. So like... Yes, it's being built everywhere, and yes, they're all filling up. I mean, it's just wow. incredible, isn't it? I, yeah. yeah I, so, <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of blown back by by some of those those figures a little bit. It's like, well, keep building. <laughs> Why keep building, and, and yeah, and you just and you just have to know that, like, you have to be able to do your feasibility study for that that specific area, right? Because somebody say, "Hey, is this a good area to build storage?" I have no idea. I have to dig into the numbers, right? So. Mm -hmm. There are, there are properties, there are locations that are oversaturated all over the place. So be careful, but there's still just a tremendous amount of opportunity to both build and buy. Interesting. So even inside a market, and I don't know if Dallas would be a good example, but say a Dallas where you'd say Dallas this big, oversaturated, but it's in these more specific areas where I could still go build in Dallas or acquire in Dallas. And that could be advantageous because the supply and demand economics on this side of town might be completely different than the supply and demand economics on the other side of town. So looking at you Dallas, it. is that rather pointless? Yeah, looking at looking at a major metro is kind of pointless. Um, Interesting. It is important, again, to, it's always important to understand macro trends. Obviously, you don't want to, you know, if Dallas was dependent on three or four employers that were all, you know, hitch and wagon going somewhere else, obviously that's going to suck down the area. Of course, mm -hmm. you can't just depend on that. But when you're thinking about a strong macro trend like Dallas, you know, great, you know, they've, they've added a million people over the last decade and tons of businesses and headquarters have moved there and relocated. There could be areas that are, again, very oversaturated and there, and there could be pockets that are, are not. And usually the pockets that are not in something like a, like a major metro like Dallas that's been kind of picked over, there's probably a reason why there's not enough storage in a particular area. Like it's disallowed through a moratorium or, property values don't justify the cost or availability of land, you know, things like that. So, um, but if you can find that sweet spot, it's, uh, it really pays dividends. And so you guys yeah. definitely believe in your thesis. I mean, there's, there's room to grow more. So talk, talk a little bit about where you see, cause I know the strategic planning as you alluded to is very important to you guys. Talk to, talk to us and the listeners about what does the next five years hold for Spartan? Yeah, so we want to be at five billion in assets under management by the end of 2025, which rolls out to about a one billion in revenue. Uh, we're looking to raise about two billion over that time, so we're really opening up different strategies for raising funds. We talked earlier today about setting up our DST fund for 1031 investors, in addition to our you know kind of our more traditional cash uh, investments in equity and debt, and uh, we're looking to continue to build the brand of, of free up storage. We realized that, you know, in just of making a really great company, you've got to have a really great net promoter score. So if you're for those familiar with net promoter score, you can look it up. But basically, we want to have a 52 net promoter score or higher. We want to have $5 billion under management. We have, want to have $1 billion in revenues. We want to get into another uh, uh, asset class. So we want to get into another vertical. What that is, we don't know yet. But by the end of the year, we want to, we want to have it identified by the end of 2023. And in, in that, we want to kind of start, uh, you know, really making free up storage its own operating platform, its own business. We recently hired a president from Extra Space, who's a VP of asset management there, to helm that brand and really grow it. And then we have our own construction company that we hired a president for that has really taken that 
uh, company to the next level. So Spartan Investment Group, we want to kind of think of like as the investment shop that has different verticals in it and, uh, you know, and, and whatever it manages, it kind of does the whole value chain. So, you know, some operators are in self storage, but they're not really doing the whole vertical integration. So we want to keep that aspect of what we do. We want to, we want to be experts within that, with that, in that space or bring in the experts in that space, I should say, and have that whole value chain. Cause that, that's what delivers the best results to our investors is when we can share the tenant insurance revenue with our investors and really control the asset and property management. And I think it makes a big difference. So these are, these are big yeah. goals. Yeah, <laughs> they are. <laughs> I know when we set the plan three Love years it. ago, yeah, we were like, we want to have 250 million at AUM and we got to 600 million. And so, and at the time I was like 200 million. I was like, holy cow, like that's just like such a lofty goal. So now, but now I'm looking at the 5 billion. And I'm like, oh my God, such a lofty goal. So we'll, we'll see how it goes, but we've got a great team in place uh, ready to execute. So we're excited about it. Yeah, that that's awesome. I mean, and, and for our listeners, yeah, they're building something really great here. Um, at Spartan, I've had the opportunity to interact with, with multiple members of your team and couldn't be more impressed, uh, and, and pleased with, with what you guys are up to. So it's very exciting. And as Ryan alluded to, we are looking at, um, you know, helping them maybe jump into the DST space. So that could be a possibility down the road. Um, that could be really, really interesting. And then for, for investment now we're, we're very close to, or are the funds available? You have three new funds, correct? Yeah. So our funds launch on March 15th. And, uh, you know, we, I love what we've done this year. It, it's really neat. So some investors are like, you know, Ryan, I'm, I'm, a, I'm retiring or I'm a doctor that works too many hours or a lawyer that works too many hours. And I'm really looking to just take my active income and turn it into passive income. And so we started a fund for that. Uh, some investors are like, you know, Ryan, I, I don't really care about your cash flow. I just want absolute return. You know, I, I love what you guys have done in the ground up space, you know, so we have a fund for that. We have a fund for higher risk, higher reward, no cash flow. And then we have those investors who are like, I don't know how this whole thing works. I just want to be in, um, you know, more of a private lending and, or private debt uh, position. So I know that I'm getting cash flow no matter what every single month. And so we create these three funds that basically solve those three problems. So if you want cash flow upside and depreciation, that's the income fund where we can you can be a LP. And then if you want the ground up development, kind of higher risk, higher reward, uh, there's the there's the growth fund. And then we have the debt fund uh, that backs that's gets backed by self storage. So we have those three different options for whatever the investor is trying to solve uh, personally uh, in their portfolio. So, yeah, excited about those two different things. We already have some properties under contract and uh, we're excited to, to kick this year off got a lot of interest in the funds. So we're excited about that. And one awesome thing is that you sort of designed that investor needs backwards of, of the way that those are structured. Yep. And then I started to get excited for, for our investors that to introduce to Spartan kind of say, Hey, we can kind of play a game where we, you know, we do a mix of these three things as well. Right. And we kind of create, kind of create your own sort of, um, sort of investment return profile based on your risk needs. That gets really exciting for, for what we're trying to do with investors as well there isn't a one size fits all option and we can kind of we can kind of play games with here with how we want to allocate to all three of them um which would be really exciting yeah and, and that's what's neat like i i think you know we'll buy like a portfolio of pro properties and it's like really hard to like in the past as a single asset syndication to say like hey you know we're like who are we trying to attract here because like if some people are like if i'm not getting cash flow right away like i hate this deal right and that that there's that investor exists that's okay but it's really hard when you know typically when you buy a pack of self storage properties you know you're going to get a little bit of everything in them so you're going to get the cash flowing properties you're going to get the development plays you're going to get the expansion so now we can sort those into the correct funds and then the investors can get can realize and it, it's less it's more of a, more sanity for us because, you know, like we bought a we bought a um, 18 property portfolio in 2021 that has five expansions on it where we build additional units and lining up the financing, lining up the equity, lining up the investor, hitting the pro forma. Exact, I mean, it's like it's it's crazy. I mean, it, you know, and so now we can say, OK, all the cash flow stuff goes over here. All the development stuff goes over here and all the investors that are in the respective funds are just going to have a better experience. And mm -hmm. so we're, we're really excited about that. 
Yeah, so much easier and so much opportunity for you to acquire any kind of asset that you really want to. You don't have to shove it into uh, one box. You've got a box and a circle and a square and a rectangle. You can put it whatever, whatever one it fits into. <laughs> Just drop it, drop it right in, and you can you can kind of keep it. That's right. So really good stuff. Um, Ryan, anything else you'd like to? Where can folks find you? So always, listeners, you can always come to us to talk about. Uh, Ryan Spartan and and any of the investment firms that we talk about always you can always start with us to talk about which one's fit best for your situation but where can people learn more about about Spartan yeah you can email uh, Ryan at Spartan hyphen investors.com you can go to our website Spartan hyphen investors.com or you can catch me on LinkedIn I think I'm like Ryan Gibson 01 is my uh, my uh, LinkedIn link or something like that but I'm always on LinkedIn and uh, yeah reach out reach out to Spartan Investment Group. Whoever that Ryan Gibson not one is, give his name back. Let him have it back. You're probably not even active on there. Yeah. No one anymore. Someone's got your name. They're probably not even active. <laughs> give it back to Ryan. I know, right? Yeah, exa- <laughs> exactly. So, no, it's funny. It's a good point. <laughs> yeah, we will whoever find, you are we will out there, if you're this. listening, yeah, we'll, you're fi- listening. we'll find them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they'll probably yeah, sell they're... it to me for like five grand or something. <laughs> so. <laughs> Standing off for their other Ryan Gibson. Five grand for your yeah, exactly. Program. Oh, that's awesome, Ryan. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Really appreciate it. Appreciate it. Take care. Awesome, and thank you, listeners. We will we will see you next time. Take care.